Let's pray. Gracious God, as we hear the stories of Jesus's final days, help us listen as if we had never heard these stories before. By the power of your spirit, engage us, shock us, and pierce our hearts so that your undying love overwhelms us with mercy and grace. Through Christ, our, your living word. Amen. So this is traditionally Palm Sunday, but we covered the Palm Sunday text a few weeks ago. And so we're going to jump to Thursday, partly because we're also not actually getting together on Thursday. Uh, there's often a lot of confusion around Jesus and what it means to follow him. And that's because on the one hand, he, he brings us freedom and grace. But on the other hand, he can be a pretty bossy guy. To some Christians, what Jesus did trumps what he said, and to others, what he says trumps what he did. Most of us are somewhere confused in the middle of those two. Largely, we will decide which one or which side we're leaning towards based, if we're honest, on what's easiest understanding right now for what we actually want to do. If we want to follow Jesus, though, we need to take him seriously and try to settle some of this. The story of Jesus and the reason he is worshipped is that he's understood to be God made man, right? He's come to take the sin of the world upon him to make right all of the wrongs, to make straight the crooked, to overturn the curse, to bring reconciliation, to bring healing and repentance and the like. Some people have always thought that because Jesus came and did what he did, we can do whatever we want, however we want, because every commandment or rule in the Bible has been completed in and through Christ, we are off the hook, so to speak. We don't need to tithe, we argue, because that's just an Old Testament idea. We don't need to lean into biblical sexuality because Jesus took care of that on the cross. We obviously don't have to worry about what we eat or how much of it we eat because if you get my drift, it's all been already taken care of. And there's a sense in which that's true, right? And that's why this is such an old problem. In fact, Paul talks about this in the New Testament as being a problem. In 1 Corinthians, he quotes other people and he says, you say I am allowed to do anything. Right? He's talking about the community of faith and what they're saying. And it's a logical conclusion. If you hear about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you are free. But Paul says, you can't take it that far. He finishes that. He says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. So when we read of the freedom we have, we have to be careful to understand how it works. Are we free to use our time however we want? Or are we supposed to use our time wisely? The challenge is this. While on the cross, Jesus does what we can't. He also sets before us a way of life. He does it in very clear teaching moments. He does it in far less clear teaching moments where he uses stories, analogies, and parables and makes it dig to do the work to understand it. And he also does things by modeling a certain way of being in the world, like when he washed the feet of his disciples, or when he showed mercy to the woman caught in adultery, or when he spends time with sinners and outcasts that other people avoid. It's a way of life. The way of life that he modeled, he did, and this is the point, he modeled it knowing that he had come to die for our sins. So when he teaches us something specific, when he makes a commandment, when he lays down a rule, he does so knowing full well he plans to die for our sins and our failures at living up to that commandment, rule, whatever it is, and he will be resurrected for it. So put another way, knowing he's going to die and be resurrected, he still calls us to live in a certain way. He still asks that we would follow the ways of compassion and the ways of love. 
So in our passage today, we're looking at what happens Thursday in Holy Week, the Last Supper, the washing of the feet. He says that what he's doing is meant to fulfill the scriptures. In other words, his actions are part of this cosmic plan, the story of God involving a Messiah that he is to be. He also says he does it so that they would be friends with him. And so all this is kind of an introduction to make clear that I don't think that that we don't want to think about eternal well-being hanging in the balance of doing all this stuff well. Like our ability or our inability to follow exactly what Jesus is asking us to do isn't the point. But we do have to try to follow these commandments he lays out for us. Christians can't just say we like this part of Jesus and not that part of Jesus and pretend we're fine. You take the whole package. And we can't just pretend he only means some of the things he says, but not others of the things he says. Like in our story today, he says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You can't just say that doesn't matter because other people's feet are gross. Are we going to be perfect at it? Of course not. Will we need forgiveness and failing? Yeah, we will. Will Jesus have compassion and grace and forgiveness for us in that? Yes, of course. But that doesn't mean we should explain it all the way. It doesn't mean that we ignore all the teachings about alleviating suffering in the world when he tells us to do so. Some churches remind themselves of this every Maundy Thursday by washing each other's feet. I'm not sure if you guys have done that here before. Probably at some point you did this. Some nodding heads, so you've, you've been there, done that. It's meant to be this concrete reminder that Jesus expects to be part of our daily lives and expects us to be servants of others. So here's what I'm wondering about this week as we calendar out all our plans for Holy Week and Easter weekend. I mean, it would would be true of any week, but maybe especially true on Holy Week. If Jesus saw our calendars or watched us, would he see people committed to following him in his ways, doing what he asks us to do? Do our schedules suggest people who are out to serve others, to serve the world in the name of Jesus, or do they suggest people more inclined to serve themselves and make themselves as comfortable as possible? Jesus didn't wash the feet of his followers so that they would feel good. He didn't do it only so that they'd be cleaned physically and spiritually, though, of course, that's part of it. He did it so that they would be empowered to go out into the world and do it too, to clean other people, to serve other people, to empower other people, to help them and to welcome them into the kingdom of God by doing so. And they did it. You know they did it, because if they didn't do it, none of us would be here. 2,000 years later. Now, there's some interpretive elements to this, to be sure. Like, did they literally wash everyone's feet? Probably not. But did they humbly serve other people in important ways where they could? Yeah. Did they share what they could of the teachings of Christ, the ways he had worked in their lives? It seems so. Did they share their actual possessions and their power when they could, when it was called for, when somebody needed something? Yeah, they did. They didn't say, feet are gross, we don't really have to do it. They didn't say, we're forgiven, we don't have to follow all this stuff. They said, Jesus told us to serve one another. We don't earn anything when we follow these ways. They knew this too. Jesus does the earning. But we demonstrate our faith in him, our trust in him, and what he has done for us when we do what he taught us to do. By loving Jesus and attempting to follow his commandments. Because we are free, because we are accepted by the only one whose acceptance really matters, we can humble ourselves in front of other people. We don't need to live in fear of others. We don't need to try to impress them because the only person worth impressing is impressed because we are clothed in Christ. We don't need to earn their love. We don't need to fear about our well-being. 
God's got it under control. God loves us. He sees to that. And that means that we can then help other people in radical ways. We can be humble and kind and generous in ways that other people would allow fear to stop them from being so. If you believe in Jesus and you want to follow him, then you have to take time to consider what your schedule actually looks like. Whether you're retired or working, you have the opportunity to have a schedule to organize your way of being in the world. As I was preparing this sermon, I actually just stumbled on this blog. It was totally random in the regular kind of blog reading I do. And it was this writer talking about seven tips to better serve Jesus with your calendar. And I thought, like, I wasn't even looking for this, but this is literally what I was preaching on anyway. So here's their first tip. Be intentional with your schedule. They say be intentional at scheduling people into your calendar and spending time with them. Look for opportunities and pursue them. If you experience rejection, keep at it until you find success, either with them or with someone else. Make a plan. List out who specifically you want to serve and plan how you want to serve them. Intentionality will go a long way. Including others in your planning of everyday matters can change your life and it can change their lives. Including others in mundane tasks, home life, family dinners. For people who eat alone, being invited to a family dinner is a big deal. And it bears spiritual fruit for everybody involved. Second is to be willing to bend to others. You see, this involves being willing to change our routine. Going out of our way to serve someone. Maybe we get up a little early sometime or we stay up a little bit late, not all the time, but occasionally. Maybe we go to a part of the city we don't normally go to. Change our routine ever so slightly to serve someone else. Three is to not make your schedule an idol. And I have to admit, this is one I struggle with. I know what works for me. I know what patterns and rhythms bring me life, bring me joy, bring me energy, and I know what doesn't. And I can be pretty fierce, as some of you have found out at times, in defending my schedule. The writer says, the way to notice if this is an idol or not is to decide if the schedule is an ends rather than a means. We're not to be slaves to anything, and that includes the schedule we've set for ourselves. Do our schedules point us in the right direction and lead us where we want to go? Another important factor is to allow for real differences and different personalities, and we're not great at this anymore. Turns out that we're not all the same. I don't know if you notice this. If any of you are on Facebook, you really see this. We don't see the world the same way, and we don't all want the same things even within a community of faith, right? Remembering this helps us not to judge each other on how we use our time. This isn't a sermon about judging everybody for wasting their time and ruining their schedules. It's not a great case to bludgeon people with the Bible and say that they're not living up to your idea or my idea of what it means to be a good Christian, that nobody should do that. Nobody should have to live up to your idea or mine. But it's the, the call is to ask yourself the personal question, whether we're following the challenging parts of what Jesus says, or just the parts we already agree with. We have to allow for varied places in life. Your schedules change based on a lot of factors. We are all asked and we all accept different levels of responsibility in the world. And they change over time, right? Some of us have demanding jobs. Some of us have very demanding kids. Some of us have demanding parents. Some of us have demanding health challenges, either our own or for people we love. The point is we're all at different stations, right? Some of us are in a joyful moment and others are in a grieving moment. We have to show ourselves the sort of grace, the understanding to understand what we're capable of, not burn ourselves out trying to live up to things, and yet also be careful not to use that as an excuse to do nothing. 
Six, another one I struggle with, don't cram people out of your schedule. Some of you are introverted. You know this, this one more than others. Paul pointed this out to the Thessalonians. He says, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. What he means is that it's entirely possible to get very busy without accomplishing all that much. I know a lot about this one, <laughs> having to-do lists. And one thing I figured out with to-do lists is they're a lot easier the less people that are involved in them, right? People are messy. They take time. They don't answer phone calls. They don't answer emails, whatever. We need to take the time to wash each other's feet anyways. Does our schedule include time for other people? People that can't give us anything in return. You might ask yourself, how could I include more people more deeply in my week? Finally, your schedule is about Christ, not about you. That would make it a great mark of Christianity, right? Do our schedules recognize that we are people who expect to live in eternity with Christ? Does the calendar represent heavenly priorities or earthly ones? Paul, remember, he writes after the, the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ, right? Like just as Jesus is teaching, knowing all that he's about to do, Paul is teaching, knowing what Christ has done, that, that peace has been won, victory is won. And he says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. We please him by doing what he asks us to do. The story of Jesus washing the feet and then calling his followers to wash other people's feet is this complicated both end of faith. They are both saved by grace. They are washed. They are cleansed. They are loved. They are recipients. And at the same time, they are called to love and serve others. If you're failing at any or all of these things, we all know we're not alone in that. We all drift. We all fail. That's why we need Jesus to come and play this role of Savior. If, like me, though, you, you do have faith and you have trust in him, then I would invite you to try to be intentional about following his lead, following his teachings, following the model that he's giving. This is a wacky example I came up with. I don't know if it'll land or not. Uh, we recently got a new cat in our house, and she's very shy. We actually got a discount buying her because she was so shy they were scared that she would get returned because she was like invisible she's black she's little and if she doesn't want to be found you, you literally don't know where she is she can be within two feet of you and you don't know till she moves so when we got her we didn't see her right <clears throat> totally disappeared eventually if you walked into a room she might be out in the open and then she would see you and then she would skirt away right so it's progress, because now she was like, at least sitting in a room in view. After a while, you could walk into the room, and she didn't dart right away. She didn't like you or anything, but she would sit just still enough. You could catch her if you went really fast. And then a little while later, she starts to walk real close to us, right? She doesn't stop, but gets close, but she's moving. Like, see, she could get away from you if you, if you flinched. And then eventually, as you all can guess, you sit on a couch and she jumps up and sits on your lap and purrs and purrs and purrs. Like it's just this progress that they make. It takes time to get that familiar, right? It takes time to build trust. And what I'm trying to bring out here is if you haven't had a lot of God stuff, so to speak, in your schedule, be gentle with yourself. Take time. You don't add everything at once. It's not useful. There's a step-by-step -step process to learning to trust God, to trust the ways of Christ, to trust the modeling, the rules. You take one that looks a bit easy, and you do it, and you think, ah, that really did help. And then you find another one, and another one, and so on and so forth. And you're building up a pattern. And then perhaps, without ever having really looked ahead to it, you find yourself purring on the couch in a way you didn't predict. 
My cat never intended to be a cat that would sit on the couch and purr with me. I guarantee you that was not her plan when she was hiding under a bed. But step by step, she got there. And step by step, if we want to get there, we can too. So in a sense, you're the cat, God sitting on the couch. I don't know if that works or not. <laughs> if you're looking for a place to start, remember that you're called to serve others out of love, not out of duty. What's an act of love that you've received from God that you can then share with others? Something that helps you hold your head a little higher, something that helps you get through the day or the week, something that helps you overcome something. How do you take that and then serve someone else with it? And because we do live in grace, and this has been a pretty heavy, for, especially for people if you're feeling particularly convicted, like nothing in your schedule suggests you go to church on Sunday, or the only thing in your schedule that suggests it is Sunday itself, we have to end with grace, because that's where the week goes. And that's how the world is built. And there's this post on Facebook that a lot of people are sharing, because it's, it's getting to be Easter, and it's really quite handy. So here's all it says. How does the thief on the cross fit into your theology? Have you seen this? Some of you? No? It says the thief has no baptism, no communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trip, no volunteerism, and no church clothes. He couldn't even bend his knees to pray. He didn't say the sinner's prayer. And among other things, he was a known thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, heal his body, or smite the scoffers. Yet it was a thief who walked into the heaven the same hour as Jesus, simply by believing. He had nothing more to offer than his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. No spin from brilliant theologians, no ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, skinny jeans, or crafty words. No haze machine, donuts, or coffee at the entrance. Just a naked man dying on a cross, unable to even fold his hands in prayer. There's a real sense in which we are all that person on the cross, no matter how good our schedules, no matter how far down the road of holiness and sanctification and following Jesus we are, we don't actually have anything of value to offer God. Jesus loves us and does the work for us and then calls us to just go out and share love. That's it. My prayer is that we would be reminded of the places that he offers us to show and share love. The passage ends with the idea, right? You're messengers of God. We are all messengers of God. And so this week, as we enter Holy Week, as we enter a time where there's going to be a bit more time off, a bit more family time, whatever, I would, I would pray for you. I will pray for you. And maybe you can pray to see opportunities to serve others in some way. No matter how small it is, take a step to serve somebody somehow. Let's pray about it. Father, we thank you that you did the work. Oh, you did all the work that needs doing. We thank you that we don't need to be proving ourselves to you or to others. Lord, help us to believe that. Help us to really feel and sense your presence, your love, your grace, your mercy, your understanding, your acceptance. So that we can more confidently and more boldly go into the world. Go into the world being your people and sharing that love, that grace, that passion with others. Lord, whether we do this all the time and we're looking for new and interesting and exciting ways to do it, or whether we haven't done it in a long time or maybe ever. Lord, would you guide our hearts, our souls, and our minds towards where you would have us help and serve? Whether it's in a congregational setting or not, Lord, doesn't really matter. Show us where we can spread your love, show your love to others. That your light would shine in the darkness, because there's a lot of darkness around us these days. Father, may we learn to wash each other's feet. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.